I'm Ali Walsh from the School of Performance and Cultural Industries at the University of Leeds. And last year I published a book on prison cultures. And so I'm very pleased to be able to join the partners that are working in collaboration with Women Theatre Justice and, and the larger project, hosting events up and down the country related to women involved in the criminal justice system. So we'll hear more about that later. And also we can signpost you to the further events that are happening and you'll see um, those are quite extensive in the coming months. Uh, okay, we've already had our um, introductions in the chat. And to say, just if there's a huge tech issue and for whatever reason we get booted off, we'll just come back on the same link um, with goodwill and hope that the, that the um, Wi-Fi monsters are on our side. So of course we're all modeling extreme patience um, and endurance in this um, Zoom-tastic meeting era. And uh, as we go along, just before I introduce our speakers, if you want to ask some questions that you think you're going to forget, or you want to make comments on what the speakers are saying while we go through, feel free to add those comments in the chat while, while you're listening. And um, unfortunately, we've not been able to have BSL interpretation uh, for this afternoon, but if you'd like any access uh, requirements afterwards and you want to message me, I'll see if we can supplement the live somehow by um, later adding the comments um, and captions to the live event. So we're still on the introductory slide for the, for the project. Um, and the, the big title of that AHRC-funded project is Clean Break, Women, Theatre, Organisation and the Criminal Justice System. We've got several of the project um, co-investigators as well as the PI, Prof. Kiva McAvinci with us for some of this afternoon. Thank you very much, folks, for joining. Um, and the project itself examines issues including the criminalisation of women, theatre practices with incarcerated women in different cultural contexts, gender, organization, and leadership, as well as the implications of COVID-19 for incarcerated women and the response of arts organizations. And so you can see several people up here on the screen and there's uh, six of them, <laughs> more than uh, the number of speakers. So we're very happy to have with us Dr. Ella Holdsworth, who is going to be uh, doing a creative response to the event as well as some live tweeting. And um, looking a little worried there where I said creative. It's going to be a blog and <laughs> talking about um, the experience of the afternoon. Thank you so much for agreeing to do that, Ella. And then um, Nicola Hollinshead, who is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Leeds with me, who will be um, also helping our colleagues in the discussion rooms. Okay, so here we are with our, yes, with our names. Um, and so to introduce our speakers, um, we have Dr. Emma Winkup, who is research manager at the Joseph Browntree Foundation. And her role there involves commissioning and managing external projects alongside developing JRF's expertise in qualitative research, particularly using participatory approaches. And her background as an academic previously to this role involved fields of crime and social policy. I'm very lucky to have met Emma at one of our events um, with undergraduate students in the past few years. So thank you very much for agreeing to be here with us, Emma. I'll introduce everyone first, um, and then we'll hear Emma first. So Dr. Sarah Bartley is associated with the Women Theatre Justice Project and is a lecturer in theatre and performance at the University of Reading. As a researcher, She's interested in exploring the intersections of work, participation and policy at play within socially engaged performance. And she has just, very hot off the press, published a book on performing welfare. Very exciting. Chiedza Chinhanu is joining us today, a current postgraduate researcher at the University of Leeds in the School of Performance and Cultural Industries. And she's undertaken pra practice-led research with women in prison in Zimbabwe using performance making methods. So um, real quick, just to talk about the how the program will work, we're going to hear from Emma, then Sarah, then Chiedza. 
Um, I think what would be helpful is if folks that aren't speaking could turn off their cameras just to give themselves a break from seeing themselves in the corner um, and engaging with the speakers. As I said, if you want to put your comments and questions in the, in the chat, we'll um, engage with them after. And um, we'll just go through the speakers and, and do it like that. And we'll have a, a mini break um, just afterwards to stretch our legs. And of course, because your cameras are off, you could always do yoga stretches while you're listening um, to really um, keep yourself active. So if, if that's okay with everyone, um, I'll just check if we've got anything coming through in the chat. If anyone wants to alert me if there's any disaster or anything, that would be grand because I can only see the screen that I'm sharing. So Emma, over to you and everyone else. Thanks very much. Uh, th thanks, Ali. Um, if you can bring up my first slide, that would be great. <laughs> yes, I'm doing the... <laughs> there we go. Okay, th thank you. That's great. Okay. Um, we're going to, Ali and I between us are going to channel a government briefing in terms of the tech, not hopefully in terms of the content, and she's going to kindly move my slides on for, for me. So I'm really pleased to be here. As I said to a group of people at the beginning, there were some things perhaps I was less sad to lose in my diary um, um, a few months ago, and, and this, this was one of the ones I re was really disappointed when we were not able to kind of meet. Um, as Ali's already said, I've got a background in academia as a kind of criminologist. Uh, and I moved to the Joseph Browntree Foundation around about a year ago then to head up uh, the qualitative research programme around poverty. So um, you'd be pleased to know then that that's, that, that just means I'm not going to be bombarding you with statistics this afternoon, uh, of which there are many in the field of poverty. Um, but I'm, I want to tell you more about the work that we do and, and to perhaps to kind of um, generally think through then the links between um, gender and, 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 poverty, and poverty, setting the scene then for some of the work we're going to be discussing later around um, criminalisation in, in particular. Um, I should also say, and I'll probably be drawing upon this perhaps more in the breakout rooms and the presentation, that also a trustee for an organisation called um, Progress to Change, which runs two approved premises, so hostels for people leaving prison in, in Leeds, one of which um, is um, specifically specifically for, for, for women then. Um, and it's so a number of people on, on this call are then are involved in supporting the women there to tell their stories through kind of creative approaches. So um, why I was particularly keen to come today though is not is into a session which is quite different from one of the ones I normally kind of speak at is because JRF in recent years have been on a journey about how to tell the story of po uh, poverty, how to support people to share their experiences of living in poverty with a view then to changing the way in which people think about poverty ultimately, meaning they're more likely then to want the politicians to take action to solve poverty. And that's involved a number of creative approaches alongside the usual products that we, we produce like research reports and statistical overviews. Um, Theatre isn't on the list, hasn't been on the list yet, hopefully will be in future, but certainly uh, as you've seen from the pre-course materials, there's been a lot of work in terms of shorter and, and longer films then to convey the, the, the realities of, of living in poverty um, for, for shorter or longer periods of, of time. So my presentation today will be talking about gender and poverty um, generally, focusing on women's experiences. Um, and I think that's partly because that's my, our remit at JRF. We don't focus on, on women or indeed men going through the kind of criminal justice system specifically. Um, we've got a much broader uh, remit. Um, but also I think it's really important to make connections between women who appear before the criminal courts um, and, and women more generally to kind of think about the sameness and different in terms of their, their experiences. I will talk a little bit about COVID-19 and its impact today, but not go into a great amount of detail. Um, I think what's a key focus of work within JRF recently has been to highlight the fact that despite the rhetoric that we're all in the same boat, um, when COVID's hit, people have, people have been exposed in different ways to its, its impact. Um, and that some groups have had far less resources to weather the coronavirus storm 
and, and women in many ways have been the, some of the hardest hit, uh, more likely to be working in industries uh, where jobs have been lost, exposed to risk when they're in key working roles um, and picking up caring responsibilities when nurseries and schools are closed, just to name a few, few examples. So I want to start off then uh, by introducing you to Caroline. Um, Ali, can I have my next slide, please? Thank you. Um, this is some work that we did last year with an organisation called Centre Point, which is a youth homeless charity uh, and, and cosmopolitan. Um, quite a, a, perhaps an unusual outfit to, uh, to, talk, uh, to talk about female poverty, but one that obviously allows you to reach a quite, quite a different audience. There's a video that um, you can find on, on YouTube and the link to that is at the end. I didn't, I'm not gonna try and sh share it here. I just want to kind of give you a, a flavor of Caroline's um, story. I think what you'll see here is a story of someone who, as far as I'm aware, hasn't been involved in the criminal justice system, but you, those of you who work with women who go through the criminal justice system will be able to kind of see the kind of parallels between her experiences. So Caroline tells us, gives a harrowing account really of a childhood um, characterized by abuse, poverty and neglect. The homelessness she um, experienced after leaving psychiatric care um, and staying in a succession of temporary places which exposed her to addiction and further abuse um, because the only alternative was to sleep rough. Um, she talks more positively though about the support she, re she receives from an organization center point which allows her to secure her own home and to access further education. And what her story is, is really revealing about then is, is the kind of the struggles, the kind of constant struggles then to deal, to deal with poverty and the difficulties of changing your life then um, when, you're, when you're faced by adversity. Uh, and the quote on the next slide, um, I think very much illustrates this. So I'll just read it because it's quite might be good to put still on the screen, depending on what technology you're using. I feel like I'm drowning in the sea and I can see the shore where everyone else is. But something keeps knocking me down. People keep throwing rocks at me and I'm constantly being pushed down, but I'm still trying to get up there. It's so tough. And if you could just move on to the next slide, Ali. So what, Caroline's story, I think it's one person, but it tells us a lot about the lives of of the uh, one in five women living in poverty in the UK today. So that accounts to about 5.2 million women. Uh, women are, are more likely to be living in, in poverty th than men. I think what her story does then is tell us about the far reaching effects of poverty when people are subject to its grip. It's more than material deprivation. Uh, she speaks about being scared, about being frightened how she didn't feel like herself anymore, how she was forced to make basic choices, for example, between having food to eat and spending money on bus fares to go to college when she was trying to improve her situation. She also speaks about her ways of, uh, of trying to kind of hide her poverty in, in a sense. So you know, staying in relationships which were, were difficult then um, so that she wouldn't kind of come to uh, perhaps end up being, going, sleeping rough and coming to the attention of sur surfaces. So we know that that statistic is probably an underestimate, but even with that into account, we can see that female poverty is commonplace, but it's that certain groups of women are, are most at risk. And that's because of their circumstances rather than the choices that they make. And so we're trying to capture that in our definition of poverty, which um, I put an extract from on the next slide. So sometimes when you look at poverty measures, they can be kind of quite uh, sterile. It's about how, how people compare to um, the average income and where people kind of fall either side of the poverty line. But this definition here is trying to um, do, do more than that. It's, it's trying to kind of capture the realities of people and, it, and its emotional Im impacts. And that's why um, the, the kind of creative work that we've been doing is so important alongside the statistics then to kind of give that kind of full picture of poverty in the UK. So that's poverty um, as a working definition. And if we explore a bit further then, we can see that whilst women are most at risk, particular groups of women are more at risk than others, which 
um, is illustrated on the next slide. So it's not possible to um, go through that list in any detail. And in a moment, I'll just take some time to look at young women in particular, because that's a group we know who are more likely to kind of come into kind of contact with the, the criminal justice system. There's a kind of couple of points perhaps to mention before, before I move on. The first is, of course, that these are, we've I portrayed them as a list here, but these are um, discrete groups. And, and, and for women then who are um, sometimes a member of more than one of those groups, then they can end up feeling particularly um, um, subject to poverty. So, for example, um, we know that disabled low mothers are one of the most impoverished groups, um, partly because they've been um, hit hardest by social security reform. And what's also worth emphasising is that along that list of people, uh, groups, we can see that the pandemic has hit almost all those groups really quite hard. So the groups of women who are already very vulnerable to poverty are probably even more so now because of coronavirus. Um, the force that society um, have worked with the Women's Budget Group and others and done some amazing work looking at the impact of the pandemic on particular groups of women as well as women more generally. Um, and there's their reports on um, disabled women, uh, black and minority ethnic women and parents are particularly worth looking at. The Young Women's Trust has done some amazing work as well, highlighting in particular the impact on, on, on young women. Okay, if you just move to the next slide, Ali. So what we what we see here then um, for for young young women then is um, trying to survive on reduced income. So this is not capturing their experience of of, of poverty in the round, but it kind of gives you the kind of statistics that, that lie be, behind that. And so for we see for, for young women then, if they are in work, the, the work that they do is not attributed to the same economic value um, as um, other groups of people. So the, the youngest women in that group then um, receive um, a national living wage. This is sometimes referred to as the minimum wage, which is, which is um, far below um, what it would be for people who are aged. Um, over 25 and we already know that that national living wage isn't isn't the real living wage and if we and we see something like w women in that, that youngest group then living on two thirds of the pay per hour that they that, that we think you need to kind of have a, have a decent standard of, of living. We also see that if if young women um, need to look to the social security system because either they're not in work or their work is low paid or it's not enough to kind of cover all their housing costs, then what, what they get is again is that this reduced reduced rate. So making assumptions, I think, about young people being able to access other types of resources um, such as in-kind support because they're living at home. Or, or having different, or having different preferences. Um, so wanting to live in a, in, a, in sort of shared accommodation, ra rather than independently. Uh, and of course, this is this is problematic for, for many groups of young women who, for various reasons, may but may be estranged from family. Um, families may not be able to support them. Um, they may not want to live in shared accommodation because of previous experiences of abuse. I mean, it's more complicated than I've portrayed there. Um, it's um, there are there are sort of exemptions to that then. But what we see then is because of the design um, of the the labour market and the design of our social security system that they are not able to um, they don't get get the same sort of entitlements then as as people who who are older. So a group then that is particularly at risk then of experiencing poverty. If you just want to move on to my next slide, uh, Ali. Mm. So I think what I've perhaps hinted at so far then is that the uh, the poverty has a female face. Um, that we there are things that the structures in place then that make it likely that women are more so than men will be experiencing in poverty. Um, and this has quite significant com consequences for, for, for women's lives, um, in, including potentially involvement in the criminal justice system, although that, that isn't highlighted um, in the report. 
that um, I'm drawing upon here. This is a report that was done in 2018 and um, by the Women's Budget Group. It would no doubt need updating because of the pandemic, but I think what the pandemic has done in relation to women in poverty is to accentu accentuate the difficulties women were already facing um, as much as to introduce new ones. So, for example, we know that women were already experiencing low pay if, if they're in employment uh, because of the work they do and the value that's sometimes atta attached to it, or because they work part time to manage care and commitments. There's this long standing uh, gender, gender pay gap that's, um, that we've seen over many, many years. And I think what's worth flagging up then is that when women are working, they are, they're more vulnerable to poverty, but be, because of their economic situation, this can continue into uh, later life as well. So that's one of the reasons why women um, who are of pensionable age are more like the men, pensionable age men to be experiencing poverty. We see that women are um, more reliant on the social security system that, than the men. So that they're hit hardest then when there's been a series of benefit reforms over, over the, the last few few years, particularly since around, around 2010. Um, and also they're sort of linked to that then is that kind of caring responsibilities that, again, which impact on their ability to engage in paid work, uh, well-paid jobs in particular, and, in, and increase the need to use the social security system. And the consequences of all those things then um, are, are quite great for women um, in terms of poor, house, poor housing, ill health, greater levels of debt and vulnerability to domestic violence and, and abuse, which is outlined in, in more detail in the report. And I think that's just sort of skims the surface of, of some of some of the issues there's, there's a lot more I think if we explore it in in more detail that we, we could we could think about and, and reflect upon reflect upon there so if we could just move on to the next slide Ali okay okay um a little bit of my slide seems to have gone gone missing in in the translation to, but um what i wanted to do in this slide is to look in specifically um at women poverty and relationships um because i think this is a good example then of the kind of city of the relationship between uh, gender and poverty it's also a good example sometimes of how um women's poverty can can sometimes get 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 hidden um, and I'm focusing on relationships then because what we what tends to happen is that when women um, have relationships and the, the literature is focusing specifically um, on relationships with men, um, it tends to protect women from poverty, or at least we think that's the case. Um, women who are single, single of all ages and lone parents then are the people who are most at risk of, of poverty. But what I want to show now then is even if women are in relationships, they can be vulnerable to experiencing um, poverty. Uh, and that this will pick up then on some of the themes that were in the Women's Budget Group report that I spoke about um, a moment ago. Um, the first is about unequal access to, to, to money. Um, for, there's some, what's really interesting piece of work going on at the moment then, um, by colleagues at Oxford and, and, and the University of Bath is about looking at financial relationships and how they can, how money is divided in, the, in those relationships and how that can reinforce gender inequality then. So we know that women are more likely than men to have caring responsibilities and that impacts often on their income from, from paid work. So women's then lack of economic power in a sense makes them more vulnerable to poverty even when resources are available within that family unit. Um, and the project that I've just mentioned then uh, came about because of social security forms have perhaps increased the, the vulnerability of, of women um, when they're not in work to have, or, or, but sometimes in work to not being able to have independent income. So university which uh, is the main benefit now for people who are out of work, has a system where people claim with a partner and the income and the money is paid to one, one account then and that could be particularly problematic in a, in a relationship. 
um, particularly if there's any domestic violence that, that's in, involved. We also know there's been changes to the way that child benefit is paid. Uh, it's quite complicated, but crucially um, for some men, it, 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 it means that um, they, they lost their source of independent income it, it, that, they, that they had. Um, because it, it tended to be paid to women in the past and that's no longer the case. And depending on their partner's earnings, they may not be eligible for it. Um, but I think this is important that, that it's been recognised. Uh, an economic ab domestic abuse bill, which I think is still making its to royal assent, uh, recognised economic abuse then for, for the, the first time then. Um, that that's the ability then to acquire, use, and uh, maintain um, economic resources, uh, and saw it then as a you know, potential example of control. Um, and I think that's import important, uh, important development that, that's there. So if we just go on to the next slide, Ali. Mm -hmm. So what are the solutions to this? I've given you a kind of a bit of a whistle stop tour of some of, some of the issues. Um, and I don't want to spend time then kind of going into um, all the detail of, of, what, of what you might do. But I think this sort of what, what you have in that list in front of you then is three different ways in which we can tackle um, female poverty. The, the third, fourth and fifth ones are kind of at the policy areas in which we work. There'll be other areas as well. But it's that is the first two perhaps I want to say most about about now. Um, developing a, a new narrative about poverty is really um, important. Um, it needs to be a, um, a narrative then that kind of reflects the values that we have as a, we want as a society um, around compassion and, and, and justice then. Uh, we want so in relation to women in poverty then we want more people then to understand and recognize female poverty so it's not hidden and to kind of try and understand the kind of connections between gender inequality and poverty so women's poverty isn't seen in terms of poor choices that they make but but, but linked to the gender inequalities in society and indeed how those interact with other forms of inequality as well and so stories like Caroline's that I spoke about at the beginning then are really important then in, t in terms of helping to uh, people to sort of shift their their views um, but although it's still recognizing that there are many many challenges of talking about poverty um, and not least then the stigma that that people who are living in in poverty face um, but crucially, we want to get away from seeing poverty as about individual deficits and think about what we need to change as a society as a whole and as a whole and how we should change society as, as a whole um, to and link it to kind of broader values around equality, for example. The second thing that's really important to do is uh, working with women living in poverty then. Um, and more than just kind of capturing their stories in a research report or including their quotes from them in a, a newspaper article. It's about supporting people to tell their stories in, dif in different ways um, and then working with them then to think about the solutions that there might be to, to poverty. Because um, people who've experienced in poverty are some of the best people who um, can come up with ideas that, that fit with what what's makes sense and are credible policy solutions. And there are things there and that, that, that need to change, I think, that, that I've flagged up in the kind of presentation. If we want to change the way um, women's economic position, it's about getting women into the labour market, um, away from being trapped in low paid and insecure work with, where there's little opportunity to progress. Um, and, and that's not just about changing labour markets, but changing the kind of structures that make it difficult for we, women to access the labour market like childcare. Um, it's about providing women as well with um, decent homes, um, places where they feel feel safe, um, places where um, there's support available if they want them, not just roofs over, over their head. Um, so I've did some work recently with women in Scotland who were, who were experiencing poverty and they gave some harrowing stories of just being provided with um, flats which were unclean, filthy in some cases, had no carpets on the floor um, and were literally just a, a roof um, rather than something they could easily turn into a home. And finally, then it's also 
about strengthening the social security system so it it's a lifeline that people can access to support themselves and their families so if you can move over to the next slide ali so there and i'm happy to share these links afterwards then uh, are the list of things that um I've um, spoken about today. Caroline's story is just a few minutes, about five minutes long on, on, you, on YouTube. If you find time to do nothing else, then do have a listen to, listen to that. It, it, it's, it's, worth, it's worth it. And I just want to flag up as a bit of a promotion, I suppose, um, the two last things on the, um, the list as well, um, because the way we talk about poverty matters. Um, it's so easy to trigger um, some of the very unhelpful cultural models about poverty. Um, when, if you, if you do go and look on YouTube and look at Caroline's story, you'll see that under the kind of comments there straight away, someone has focused their attention on, on what, what she looks like and the fact that she has a tattoo and she's got, she's wearing, she's got piercings and, and, and rather than engaging with the kind of harrowing story that she, she tells, um, because and it's people uh, it's so easy to kind of trigger those kind of negative ideas that poverty is because of people making bad choices but that's far from the case so if you just move on to the last slide early mm -hmm. so let's keep talking about women in poverty um that's my um a twitter handle there's my that email very happy to kind of connect with with people then and uh, talk more about women in poverty thank you Thank you so much. I'm going to just practice the uh, emoji clap as though we were all in a room and able to uh, to uh, give each other some clapping. Thanks, Erin, for the <laughs> for the uh, accessible clap there too. Um, Emma, if you're okay with that, we'll we'll move into Sarah's presentation, um, and if people have. Uh, burning questions that they're worried they'll forget. If you want to pop them in the chat for now, that's absolutely a good idea. And um, we'll come back to Emma in just a moment. And um, Sarah, if you're happy to, gosh, so quick off the mark, there we are. Um, and if you'd like to kick off, I just want to make sure I'm muted. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Grand, thanks very much, Ali, and, and thanks, Emma, for that um, amazing sort of work around um, contextualising the work that you're doing and, and really getting us to start to think about um, how we tell these stories. And I hope that this will be a sort of continuation of how we tell this sto these stories um, through a particular exploration of the work of, of Clean Break. And I'm aware that we have some clean break folks with us today, so I'm excited um, to share this with, with you and, and with everybody. Um, so as Ali noted in her introduction, I'm part of a team of researchers working on Women Theatre Justice, a two-year project that explores the work of clean break theatre company. We're examining the company's impact on contemporary theatre and exploring clean break as an organisation run by women for women with distinctive organizational practices. And the project is sort of aiming to create opportunities for artists, academics, women with experience of the criminal justice system and those who work with them to share their experience through seminars, training, podcasts and teaching resources. So I really wanna thank our collaborator Ali Walsh for bringing us together today to reflect on themes around criminalization and poverty. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to consider the relationship between poverty and the criminal justice system and how that's been represented in performance. And specifically, I examine maybe a bit ambitiously four clean break theatre productions, each of which offers, offers us a distinct perspective on what theatre can contribute to discussions of poverty and criminalisation in the UK. I point to poverty and economic dependency as a recurrent theme in Clean Break's work over the past decade and assert the importance of using multiple approaches to representations of poverty in cultural works that address criminality. So for those of you who, who haven't encountered Clean Break's work before, Jenny Hicks and Jackie Holborough founded the, the women-only theatre company Clean Break in 1979 driven by an urgency to initiate dialogues around women and incarceration. 
They are based in North London, but they work across England, and the company continues to work with women, predominantly those with experience of the criminal justice system and or secure mental health settings. And at the heart of their practice is the sharing of marginalised women's stories and the fostering of female artists' work. And to that end, I'm going to talk about some of those female artists' work now. So the first, first production I want to talk about is Pests. Vivian Franzman's Pests was produced at the Royal Court and Royal Exchange Theatres in 2014, after being commissioned by Clean Break when Franzman was playwright in residence with the company. Pests follows two sisters, Rolly and Pink, and opens with Rolly returning home after a short prison sentence, heavily pregnant and keen to make a fresh start. But throughout the play, we see the impossibility of transcending the social and economic exclusion that is repeatedly and brutally imposed on the sisters. Rolly and Pink have been dispossessed at every turn. Their exclusion from education, their experiences of abuse, their traumatic encounters in the care system, their inability to access support for addiction and mental health issues, and the persistent discrimination they experience locking them out of employment. The production stages an extreme vision of the social conditions of dispossession. Um, and poverty informed the production from the outset. Franzman has elaborated on how her position as resident playwright with Clean Break was fundamental to her focus on poverty, saying, as you can see on the screen there, the thing I noticed straight away that I hadn't really considered, which I feel naive saying, was that, oh, the thing I noticed about prison straight away, rather, that, that I hadn't noticed or considered, which I feel naive saying, was that it's full of poor women, women who suffer from poverty and the circumstances of poverty. And I was just so outraged at that. Franzman is of course right, and her experience is supported by a range of research uh, a very small amount of which I've just included on a slide there. And perhaps Franzman's realization is closest to what criminologist Joe Sim artic articulates as the penal management of poverty and inequality, wherein those with no capital get the punishment. And Pest sought to make an intervention in understandings of criminalized women by staging this relationship between poverty, exclusion and criminal behaviors. So 2014, Pests was also located in a wider cultural conversation that some of you may remember, which orbited depictions of social exclusion, the discussion of so-called poverty porn or fetishized representations of people living in states of economic de deprivation. And while the phrase poverty porn has been around for decades, discussions around these particular representations kind of exploded into the mainstream in 2014, alongside Channel 4's documentary series, Benefit Street. Indeed, Franzman references this debate when reflecting on writing pests, saying, I didn't want it to be voyeuristic or poverty porn. I was very conscious of a middle-class audience watching poor people. How then might performance offer strategies for depicting poor women and criminalized women in ways that are resistant to such readings. And one such strategy in Pests was the staging of this kind of conflict around representation. Um, early in the play, Rolly and Pink are watching a Life of Grime slash How Clean Is Your House style TV program. Uh, and I've got a quote there from, from that scene where they're watching, watching it. And I'm just gonna give you a, a minute or so to kind of engage with, with that quote. So yes, in, um, in the words of Pink, this is shit, man, seaside circus freakage, poor daft. In having Pink speak directly to the contemporary conversation around the ethics of representing poverty, Pests staged a central tension in its own production. Why are predominantly middle-class audiences here to see this work? And how does it shape their own imaginaries of incarcerated women? of poor women, of excluded women. 
Later in the play, an imagined, an imagined conversation from Rolly's job interview, Pink offers a summary of the sisters' lives, which includes a knowing commentary from the perspective of a middle-class manager. So Alki, nut job, dad, piss, shit, punch, junky mum, no shoes, lice, black eye, care, fucked, excluded, bullied, foster home, no, prison, no, prison, no, prison. Oh my gosh, it must have been so terrible for you. I can't imagine what it must have been like to have been born into a life of such deprivational violence. Horrifying, absolute horrification. So... In staging these scenes, uh, I'm arguing that Pest's demands we look at Pink and Rolly, who throughout the production are neglected, excluded, and left to decay. It simultaneously asks audiences why they are looking at these women and how we imagine such poverty. Pest illuminates the brutality of poverty, but it also seems to intervene in cultural representations of acute hardship and asks how we might seek to represent these in ethical, effective, and politically interventionist ways. And in the rest of this talk, I consider the ways in which Clean Break tried to attend to some of the questions illuminated by this reading of pests. So also in 2014, uh, performed in a tent at Latitude Festival, Meal Ticket examined secrets around money and trading, the shame around debt, the money we owe, and the people who chase us or judge us for our debt. Throughout the play, performers reveal the price of everything that appears on stage, and also the costs which are less immediately visible. From t-shirts and jeans, to how much it costs to style their hair and bodies, to the debts of another kind, like managing the aftermath of addiction on the body. Performers rattle through prices and encounters with money in staccato, sparse dialogue that ensures the focus always remains on cost. The discussion builds throughout the show, moving from physical appearance to the bodily costs consigned to women, to the monetary relationships we have with the state through benefit and social housing, to the relationship between criminality and economic dependency. Meal Ticket articulates the way money, poverty and debt shape people's lives and proximity to criminality from early on, as you can see with the orange text on the left of your screen there. Um, they're speaking to very kind of uh, ex experiences of money and, and, and cost uh, from, from a young age. Um, it also underscores the links that have been shown uh, between women's involvement in crime and coercive relationships with men, which Emma's pointed to in, in, in part of her discussion earlier. Uh, and as you can see in the sort of text on the right of your screen, um, it's sort of talking to that relationship between, um, or the importance of relationships in, in, in criminal activity. The play also points to the ways we talk about money and undercuts the sayings and expressions that circulate so readily with the material realities of money and debt that these women have encountered. Money can't buy you happiness. Life is worth more than money. The best things in life are free. I'm begging outside of an offline license. It takes money to make money. Money makes the world go round. Money doesn't grow on trees. I'm in the toilet, too dirty to go into the rest of the flat. The juxtaposition of phrases and colloquialisms like money can't buy you happiness with a series of bleak experiences of poverty underscores the importance of economic means in accessing safe housing, warmth and food. Against the backdrop of punishing austerity policies that persistently request we all tighten our belts and count the pennies, Meal Ticket asks what are the stakes of women with experience of the criminal justice system making transparent the cost of everything. This strategy of economic transparency foregrounds the, uh, foregrounds the cost to and worth of these women's lives. Meal Ticket expands perspectives on criminalized women to encompass an understanding of how money, poverty, and debt might shape criminal behaviors. Okay, I wanna move now to another production, Joanne, which is sort of stationed 2015 and 16. 
performed at the Soho Theatre in 2015 and at the RSC's Making Mischief Festival in 2016. As a production, Joanne has an austere aesthetic with five differently sized thick white picture frames hanging down on an otherwise empty stage. Performer Tanya Moody, who you see in the image here, occupies the stage alone, delivering five interlinked monologues, each penned by a different playwright with upright fluorescent lighting tubes changing color to indicate a change in character. We meet Stella, the probation officer in touching distance of leaving the service. Grace, a single mother and policewoman trying to somehow bend the justice system into a shape that accommodates complicated lives. Desperately underpaid and overstretched a and &E receptionist Kathleen, who's at the very front of the front line. Alice, the manager of an understaffed hostel left clogging the gaps. And Becky, a buoyantly optimistic teacher who's green at the gills enthusiasm ebbs away over the course of her monologue. All of them speaking to us about one woman, Joanne, someone they each helped or tried to help, but hopelessly pressurized public services are at breaking point. And Joanne, it seems, has fallen through the cracks. The main strategy of the play is, descent, is the decentering of Joanne by her literally not appearing and instead foregrounding the stories of those working within desperately underfunded public services. And this shifts attention from the individual to the systemic. In social welfare policies from the mid nineties onwards, there has been a focus on personal responsibility. And this has asserted individual pathologies as the root cause of poverty. The rhetoric of individual responsibility amplified under the coalition government eliding broader considerations of the labour landscape, increasing rent and eroding support systems, constantly rendering the individual, and this is part of what Emma was speaking to earlier, the individual at fault for their own experience of poverty. So this kind of representational approach that we see in Joanne directly challenges this idea of individual responsibility. Instead, through depicting five women who orbit Joanne, the piece asserts their collective responsibility and beyond that, it argues for a sort of broader social responsibility that we all have in maintaining these services. Joanne demonstrates that poverty is a social problem rather than an individual flaw. And finally, I want to talk about spent. Uh, this is the final example I'm going to discuss today. And spent, like meal ticket, was performed by three graduates of Clean Breaks Education Programme. It was performed at conferences, training events in universities, the criminal justice system, and debt and mental health services. But instead of focusing on the content of Spent, I want to turn to how this play, in its casting of Clean Break members as performers, invites us to consider how particip participants in performance projects are remunerated for the work they undertake. So to be clear, I'm, I'm not talking about people who identify as actors in their career at this point, but rather members of Clean Break who've been engaging with the different cultural and educational provision offered by the company. For example, in Spent, the participant performers were all accessing welfare support and unable to be paid a wage for the short performance run they were, run, uh, they were sort of performing in. So beyond Spent, across their body of participatory work, Clean Break has found navigating systems of ad hoc remuneration extremely challenging for participant performers, particularly those who are accessing state benefits. As Herman notes, we've had a long and quite difficult journey finding a way to reward work because unpaid work and the idea of unpaid work can undermine what we're aiming to do in terms of empowerment, as financial independence is a key part of that. So we're really conscious of not exploiting women's experiences by expecting them to move from being students into touring. And especially when we're in environments when we're being paid for the output, which is often what happens when we go on tour. It does feel very conflicted. And part of Clean Break's agenda is to support women to move out of the benefit system and obtain financial independence. However, navigating systems to pay participants is deeply complex. And Clean Break have used a range of methods to try and recognize the labor undertaken by participant performers without putting people at risk of infringing their job seekers agreements or benefit support in any way. 
And these approaches have included a training fee, vouchers, a bursary scheme, all of which have their own limitations and as state systems have changed, have had to be revised in response to best practice advice. Clean Break has subsequently explored self-employment, contractual employment, and the impact of these approaches on universal credit. But uh, HMRC and the Department for Work and Pensions advice for employing women to undertake temporary performance work of this nature remains unclear. Uh, and Clean Break now believes they've found an appropriate way forward, both legally and ethically, uh, but it is aware that what little advice exists could change at any point, which would leave the company and their performers vulnerable to punitive actions from HMRC or participants encountering difficulties in rejoining welfare support beyond a, a production cycle. So this rigid and punitive system of universal credit thus presents obstacles to the professionalization of these women through their engagement in paid labor. And I'd say that this requires an urgent consideration and linked up conversations across socially committed performance in order to identify how participants' labor is being categorized and share best practice for acknowledging and rewarding it. Such material considerations are crucial to enabling participation and supporting participants. Sort of this is a particularly acute within performances that deal with unemployment, poverty, and austerity. So to conclude, um, speaking about the women Clean Break work with, co-artistic director of the company, Anna Herman, has identified that the women's circumstances, experience of violence and trauma, drug and alcohol use have been consistently there, but the impact of poverty and the closing of services has escalated. As poverty, and this is sort of me now moving away from Anna's words, as poverty continues to acutely impact people's lives, it's vital we reflect on how these experiences are represented. The four productions I've examined today offer pertinent provocations around the representation of and encounters with poverty that occur in Clean Break's work. And, and I, I propose more broadly. So while Emma finished with some beautiful kind of solutions, I'm afraid I've finished with some questions. Um, so how does performance intersect with, replicate or challenge broader conversations? around the criminalization of poverty and cultural representations of marginalized people? How might transparency around cost work as a performance strategy that can reveal the ways in which poverty might shape criminality and expose how little value is given to marginalized lives? How might representations decenter the individual experiences of poverty to direct attention to the defunding and overburdening of structures of care and systems of support? And how might theatre makers share best practice in attending to the pragmatics of care when engaging with the most economically vulnerable participants? So I think I'm just going to leave you with those questions there now and pass over to Chietza. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, very, very rich uh, presentation. And I'm sure we've got lots of questions coming into the chat right now. And Chiedza, as quick as anything, has um, started sharing her screen there. Um, so Chiedza will do a shorter presentation. And um, in the meantime, if folks can prepare themselves for um, discussing what you've heard, thinking about um, the things that might connect up these different presentations. And um, thanks, Chiedza. We look forward to hearing from you. Lovely. Thank you so much, Ali. And uh, thank you for organizing this event and for giving me the opportunity to speak today about my research on incarcerated women in Zimbabwe's prisons. And thank you to the speakers that have spoken. Um, so what I will focus on today is um, part of my PhD research, which seeks to understand the practices of sharing lived experiences with women in Zimbabwean prisons. Um, so just to give a brief background, for four months between September 2019 and January 2020, I facilitated participatory theater workshops with incarcerated women in two of the three main female prisons in Zimbabwe. My main research project was in Chikurubi female prison, which is located in Harare which is the capital city of Zimbabwe. So I was in Chukurubi female prison for three hours, three days a week. Um, 
And here I also facilitated workshops with foreign prisoners and prisoners with mental health issues. I also visited another prison in the Midlands rural province of Zimbabwe, which is called Ashurubi Female Prison, where I lived with prisoners and um, prison officers at the prison for one week. Now, the two, these two prisons are predominantly Shona speaking regions. I fortunately, I did not get the um, chance and opportunity to visit Ndebele speaking uh, prison in the Mateveleland province in Blawayo because of limited resources. And, but however, to make up for this, I ran theater workshops with uh, the Ndebele speaking women who get transferred from Mulondoloze prison to Harare. So gathering information from incarcerated women in urban rural areas, uh, in rural areas, and from the two ethnic groups and foreign, foreigners offered my research a comprehensive understanding into incarcerated women's experiences. Now, going into prison, I was aware of my outsider insider identity. So although born and raised in Zimbabwe, my education is in Western epistemologies and being affiliated with a former colonizers university, I considered my status and how it would impact my research. Therefore, I took the approach of a naive researcher coming from outside through the practice of autography. Now, autography is uh, an ongoing process of art making and embodiment. So the practice positioned incarcerated women as the producers of knowledge and intellectuals who have something to tell us about arts practices in, uh, in prison. That is what exactly it does in marginal spaces. This is a continuation of my work in prison, which I started in, uh, in my MA, where I was researching what it is that aesthetics actually does in such context. So in my womanist prison autography, numerous histories came together in one place. The methodology more, was morphed from the process of playing traditional indigenous games, reflecting on those games through writing and drawing, improvisations, reflecting again, scripting, going back to reflection, rehearsing more reflection, and then performances to an audience. The development of the practice flowed from the women as they were willing to work through a rigorous and continuous form of reflexivity and analysis, which allowed for deeper understandings to emerge over time. One of the findings from my research practice was motherhood, which is a crucial issue in the criminalization of poverty as reflected in a journal entry by one of the participants. Now I'm going to read it as it is and hopefully you will get the meaning. Today I have a bad day. I don't wanna lie. I miss my kids a lot. I wish I'm home with them. I ask God why I end up in this mess, why I join those criminals who lead my life into this bad life. I blame myself why I follow them. I wish my mom was still alive. Maybe she was going to help me. She was my pillar of strength, my teacher, my everything. She meant the whole world to me. I miss the good times I had with her. She stood by me at all times, but to my side, I failed to stood by my children. How foolish mother I am. I'm a bad mother to my children. I pray everything so that God will forgive me my sins. I hope God will reunion me with my family. I'm really sorry, guys. Forgive me, my sister, my brother, all my relatives. I didn't mean to hurt you. I'm sorry. Now, out of the 42 participants I worked with from both prisons, only three were not mothers, but when asked, they said it's something which they aspire to. Now, the subject of motherhood or mothering has been a central concern of feminist criminology scholarship, particularly one coming from the global north. Um, so from engagement with such scholarship, scholarship, it is filled with presentations of motherhood as a burden which contributes to women's offending. This is because women are left with the responsibility of care and within the Zimbabwean context, a high percentage of women have no ties to the paid labor force because of lack of educational qualifications and also because of um, the economy of Zimbabwe, which is not viable at the moment. Therefore, women like this participant are motivated to commit crimes as a rationale response to the poverty and economic security. Now, this is one side of the narrative. 
which in my opinion is a picture of women as victims of patriarchy, that they are pressured to have children and of the socioeconomic conditions. The other side, which I focus on mostly in my work is motherhood as referred to by incarcerated women and their own understanding and construction of it. Now, what's interesting about this participant's intro journal is that it is written under a praise poetry which she wrote about her mother. In the poem, which is written in the Shona language, she celebrates her mother as a woman who's intimately involved in the care of her children and home. She praises her mother for providing for her needs, for nursing her wounds, serenading her to sleep, disciplining her, instilling in her good values, teaching her good manners, how to care for herself, putting her through school and praying for her. This was agreed by the participants as the epitome of a good mother. In a writing, Nigerian writer Catherine Ocholonu constructs a concept she calls motherism, which upholds women as, which upholds motherhood as a respected source of empowerment for women. This is because spiritually, it is from a mother that all life proceeds. Now, according to Ochunulu, motherism is central to African metaphys. A mother is a nurturer, a homekeeper, a defender of her children, and provides for the need of her home. Acholonu ascribes words such as priest and goddess to women and custodians of Mother Earth and its survival. The importance of women in Sub-Saharan Africa is situated within such a context. And yet this huge part of women's identity is often challenged and threatened, leaving women feeling like less of human beings. Now, because women are committed to their motherhood identities, they seek to perform them, and, um, but are uneducated and they live in poverty. So they try to find alternative ways available to them in order to provide, um, which often results to selling vegetables and fruits on the streets and sex work. Now the two are prohibited and are offenses by bylaws. The bylaws which are entrenched in penal codes inherited during the colonial, colonial era. The rationale for enacting these laws um, to maintain public order, public safety and crime prevention. A thorough analysis of these laws shows how they target a particular class of people, punishes, segregates, and controls and undermines the dignity of those people on the basis of their status. The, the laws are also very vague and allow for arbitrary arrest as they give law enforcement officers wide discretion for enforcement due to their status. They also allow the arrest of the poor without a warrant, without investigation and without evidence or intent to commit such crimes. All this is inconsistent with the right to equality, non-discrimination and equal protection of the law. In the circumstances of most women I encountered in Zimbabwean prisons, the criminalization of actions and decisions of these women affect, effect, um, effectively amounts to the criminalization of poverty. Now, like this participant, most mothers in prison, they judge and condemn themselves for their decisions and their actions. They see themselves as foolish and bad mothers in light of their imprisonment state. This has an immense effect on their sense of selfhood. Now, what the autography practice in prison became was that of sharing and reflecting on these experiences of motherhood in order for them to find their sense of selfhood again. Within the process, the women improvised a scene in which a mother on her way from church sees a herd of goats grazing and steals a kid, dresses it like a baby with a hat and socks and puts it on her back. When she's almost home, the kid bleats and kicks, which gives her away. The scene, the case becomes a national news headline. This humorous scene, not only reflected and mocked the Zimbabwean criminal justice system for criminalizing petty offenses, but it also opened up discussion for women to realize their agencies through their decision and actions. They were, the resounding and uh, resonating theme was, there is nothing I wouldn't do for my children. The women began to affirm each other for being good mothers. They perceived of their crimes and performances of their role and identity of mother. A woman committing crime in the eyes of society is a bad woman. 
Therefore, by claiming agency in their crimes, the women challenge the power structures of patriarchal society that model a good woman. What the women are concerned with is becoming good mothers, not good women. The latter is a construct of, pat pat uh, of patriarchy, while the former is a construction of self. Now, I am going to end here because of the time that Ali gave me. I am open to uh, receive, you know, because I'm still in the process of uh, structuring my thesis. And so I would love some uh, feedback and uh, further readings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chiedza. I think um, we have lots of lots of things that we can um, bring to our conversation now. That was very rich. Thank you so much, everyone, for for joining us. Thank you very much to our speakers, Emma, Sarah, Chiedza, and I'm going to do a little clap, virtual clap, just because I can. Um, as well, and um, to all of those from the project that have joined and all the guests from across the sector, thank you very much. Um, I'll stay on the call if anyone feels like they're going to be bereft if they leave now without saying a final thing. I'll stay here for a couple of minutes and um, please do fill in the feedback and have a very good afternoon. Thank you so much. <laughs>